for the first time is based on essence existence distinction. It's not found. Of course, you find this distinction in Aristotle, but it's not made the foundation of metaphysics. Right? This distinction is you find in Farabi, but doesn't make it foundation. But he makes it a foundation. This is very important. Essence, existence. You see, the answer to two questions, what it is and that it is. What it is. Everything is what? This is a chair, this is a, let's say, microphone, this is paper, everything which exists is what? Right? You ask what it is. It's a very normal question. It's a very important philosophical question. What it is, what it is. Ma huwa. In Arabic, ma huwa, what it is. Mahiya, what it is. So mahiya means it's whatness. So, you call it its quiddity or essence. Essence, so something might have a quiddity, but it, n- it might not exist. You ask, does it exist? Does it exist or not? So, there are two questions that one ordinarily asks. He made this a distinction between quiddity and existence, the basis of the foundation of his metaphysics. The foundation of metaphysics in Aristotle were the ten categories. Ten categories. Being is divided into ten categories, substance and nine accidents. But in Aristotle, now, being and essence, we have two kinds of things. In creatures, in creatures, they are contingent beings. Contingent beings, their quiddity, their essence does not necessitate their existence. I can think of paper. It can exist, it cannot exist. It's possible it might not exist, all right? Things existing in the world are contingent. When you think about their quiddity, you cannot, by analysis, derive being from their quiddity, by analysis, all right? They might exist or might not exist. So, another problem is the super addition of being. Super addition of being to, let's say, essence or quiddity in contingent things. I mean, the accidentality. Accidentality is very, I mean, Westerns have made a mistake, and this goes back to Averroes. Averroes was a very great misinterpreter of, 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 of Avicenna. A very great misinterpreter of Avicenna was Averroes. And his misinterpretation was accepted in Europe by Thomas Aquinas and others, unfortunately. See? When we say that, let's say, when we say that being is an accident, doesn't mean that it's an accident like, let's say, quantity quality. Means that, I mean, these two concepts of being and essence are different from each other, are different. One is super added to the other. For example, I am thinking of this paper and white, The concept of white is different from paper. This is accidentality, different. Not that it's an accident, they're different concepts, all right? Being is not the same as essence, they're different. This difference is called accidentality, so it's not an accident at all. Uruz, uruz, the uh, the word we use is uruz, uruz, means super added. This is other than that. But it was interpreted by Averroes and by St. Thomas that it's an accident. It was quite misunderstood. So we have two kinds of things. Necessary being, being is the same as 
existence, uh, as quiddity, and contingent things. When you think of the created world, I mean, from analyzing their concept, you cannot derive existence. Existence, something added to it, all right? So they need a, a cause in order to make them be. They cannot be the cause of their own being. So this contingency necessity argument goes back to Avicenna. Know that. You are never, you see, the, one of the best proofs for the existence of God is the proof from contingency and necessity, possibility and necessity. Things of this world all are contingent. You cannot derive their being from their essence. They are indifferent to being and to non-being. They are quite indifferent. So they cannot cause themselves. In order to be, they need a cause, and this cause cannot be infinite, because they would, couldn't, if they were infinite, they could not exist. They should end in a necessary being. This proof is Avicinian, very great, very great. Gilson believes that, yeah, Gilson believes that this is the best proof because it's the most metaphysical proof, you see? And it's metaphysical proof first, and it is at the basis of all other proofs, as if all other proofs of the existence of God presuppose contingency necessity. For example, the proof from motion, motion from motion this world to prove first mover. It's based on contingency necessity in the order of movement. And so is the case in other proofs. In any case. Now, other contributions, his discussions about Mabda Omaat, about prophecy. He has very good argument about the necessity of prophet, philosophical proofs of prophecy. You find in Shafai's books that the being of a prophet is necessary. See? If God created the world and did not guide people, that would be an imperfect world. I mean, proving necessity by philosophical argumentation. Are, is worship necessary or not? What is the use of worshiping God philosophically and he has a very good discussion. Whether we need an imam, people, a spiritual leader to lead them or not. This discussions, of course, he's not a dogmatic theologian. He's a philosopher, you see. You can you find these discussions in dogmatic theology. Dogmatic theology is different from philosophy. Problems are the same. You, problem of God, you find in Kalam, in Kalam and in philosophy. But the approach, the method is quite different. A Mutekallim, a theologian, says that because Quran or the Bible have said this, I accept it and I give proof. But the philosopher say no, you should prove it on, on pure rational grounds, not because this or that said, from purely rational grounds. So, he proves it philosophical. And also, his innovations are very great in the field of psychology. Psychology, rational psychology, is elevated to a very, very high peak. Very ambiguity is in Aristotle. He's un Aristotelian in his psychology at all. He's un Aristotelian. Proving the materiality of the soul. You see, in Aristotle, the soul is a form of the body. If it's a form of the body, it can never be separated. You have many problems. If, let's say, it's a form of a body, 10 proofs, I'm not going into that, 10 proofs that the soul is in immaterial. See, very, very important. Nafs, in Arabic, means Self. But when you read psychology from 
psuche, psyche, soul, you do not understand the self. See? But he understands a self, not only a soul. See? His arguments revolve on I, the self as an I. That it is an independent reality, it's immaterial. He believes in the theory of Hubut, it has descended from divine origin. He has a very famous philosophical ode called Qasidatul Ainiya, very well known. Have you ever read his Qasidatul Ainiya on so? Very great, very masterpiece, a literary masterpiece. You see, a literary, really. Many people in the history of philosophy and many literary figures have tried to imitate him and say something similar concerning soul and their faith. It's so great, old and soul. It begins, Habitat ilayka min al-mahal al-arfai varga'u zaw tatamannu'in wa tarafu'i and so on. Very beautiful. That it has, it has divine origin and descended and uses, makes the body and uses the body. It's very, so his, and also his distinction between different levels of intellect. One of the main things developed in Islamic philosophy is the theory of intellect, Aql. You have this theory in Aristotle. Aristotle has only two kinds of intellect, potential intellect and actual intellect only. You see, he says, for example, in everything, we believe that in everything there is a potentiality and actuality. We should believe the same in the intellect. So intellect, there is a potential intellect and the actual intellect, all right? But there has been a lot of discussion. His discussion is very, very vague, very, very vague. Is potential actual intellect in the soul? Many people like St. Thomas, especially in the West, believe that actual intellect is an intellect within the soul. Because he said, Aristotle said in his discussion that within the soul we should make the same distinction within the soul, basing themselves within the soul. They say that it is something in the soul. But he has a simile. He says that as sun gives light to the eye by which it is able to see, the intellect is like the sun. The sun is something outside the eye. So other people arguing on the basis of the simile believe that it is something outside. So there are many, many interpretations. Muslims have written a lot of great works on intellect. Mind you, I mean, you have a long tradition. Farabi has a treatise on intellect, which was translated into Latin. You see? It was translated into Latin and much used. Unfortunately, we do not read. Unfortunately, we do not read. It was much used in the Latin world. It's on intellect, de intellectu. It was called de intellectu. Means Kendi has a also another de intellectu. Kendi also had another treatise which was translated into many treatises. About twenty treatises of Kendi were translated into Latin and much used of Farabi too. Farabi's book, De Antelectu, his kitab, Ehsa'ul Ulum, was translated into Latin and much used. Ehsa'ul Ulum, enumeration of sciences, and many other things were translated. You see, they were either translated, there was another way of transmission, indirect way of transmission. Direct way is through translation, all right? Direct ways through translation. All the works of, for example, of Averis, all the works were translated, both 
into Hebrew and into Latin. Now, you have some words of average in Hebrew or Latin which you do not have in Arabic. The Arabic is lost, but you have Hebrew translation or Arabic translation. And they work, the Westerners work on this, and they write books, spread your books on that. Very important. Now, so, there is one direct way, right, through translation, either into Hebrew or Latin. There is an indirect way. And that is through Jews in Spain. The language of Jews in Spain was Arabic. All right? It's very important. The language of Jews. For example, Ibn Maymun. Do you know that Ibn Maymun lived in Egypt? He was the physician of three, two Fatimid caliphs and the physician of Saladin the Ayyubi. You do not know. You should read history. And he wrote all his works in Arabic. In Arabic, but in Hebrew alphabet, you see, in Arabic, but in Hebrew alphabet, they all exist. So, they came from Spain to Baghdad and collected books and brought there, and they were quite familiar with all these theories, all these Muslim theories. For example, they were very great philosophers. Some of them were Jews and later Muslims, like Abu Barakat Baghdadi, like let's say, uh, Ibn, what was, uh, Ibn Kamuna, they were Jews. They were very great philosophers, so they have communication, correspondence with these Jews, and took books with them to Spain, and you find these theories in Jewish books, which some of them were translated into. So, in any case, I'll finish my discussion, but let me mention one point, the last point about Avicenna which is greater than all. Many points I mentioned. This is much greater than all. You see, I was editing a work, early work of Avicenna, his first work, very great. He wrote it at the age of 20. We found the manuscript. It's a synopsis of philosophy, but the examples are not Greek. He has changed all the examples into a song. He wrote it at the age of 20, 21. He wrote his greatest work, Shefa. It's about 16 big volumes. Perhaps the biggest encyclopedia written by one man, by one single man, was by Avicen. He was at the age of from 38 to 40. So what a tremendous change between this period of 20 years, from this early work to this this his mag masterpiece, which he wrote about, about 17 or 18 years later. Now, in the beginning, in the introduction of this book, he says that I have done this. He wants to say that I've systematized, I've axiomatized. I mean, things in Aristotle were very scattered, very deficient, very, very things, very deficient. But I've, all right, I have another book called Al-Hikmat al Oriental philosophy. All right? I have, I know, he right mentions right in the beginning of his Shafarid, in the very introduction, in the first, second page. I have written another book called Al Hikmat al Mashriya, Oriental philosophy, and those who want to get acquainted with my own philosophy should read that. Unfortunately, we have only the introduction of that book. We have been printed. We have some copies introduction, the original book. We don't know whether what we, it is called Mahma, it's the same or not. But we have, it has been published. In the introduction of this Hikmat al he says that there are some very rigid and very narrow minded people who think that Aristotle has said everything about philosophy. They are like Hambalites in Fiqh, they are not read able to accept anything other than, let's say, what they say. They have, they have don't lend their ears. So, 
in my youth, I was very interested. I wanted to defend it. There were many, many errors in Aristotle. There were many lacuna and many voids and many defects. I mended them. I tried to defend. But I have no, I have come to know philosophy through other sources, other than peripatetic, other sources. And I, in this book, I try to give you a synopsis of that philosophy. Unfortunately, the book is lost. But he had written some books on this subject. He had a book now lost called Ketabul Ensaf in 20 volumes. The Book of Arbitration between East and West, concerning many thousand problems. It will talk. I mean, when Aris, Avicenna said 20 volumes, his volumes are very big, you see, very volume. We do not have. This book was lost in the sack of Esfahan by his arch enemy, Mas'ud Ghaznavi. Ghaznavi is disliked. Avicenna because they had invited him to come to Ghazna, he refused because they were against philosophy. They were against philosophy. They invited both Biruni and Avicenna. Biruni went and stayed there, but Avicenna managed to escape immediately. He said that it's very dangerous. He changed his clothes and, let's say, immediately escaped from there and he came to Iran and he came to Isfahan. So they disliked him and they attacked Isfahan. The first thing they did, they sacked his home. Still we have other books. For example, there are some, uh, let's say, uh, what we call like Hayyibni Yaghzan. He has some treatises, Hayyibni Yaghzan. Resalatun fil Ish, Resal, treatise on love. Resalatun Tayr. And his discussions on Sufis, on Sufis, Maghamatul Arifin, and things like that, it is philosophical Sufism, a sort of philosophical, not Sufism, philosophical Sufism. In the end of his life, his oriental philosophy, and of course I'll talk a little more about its development in later philosophers. Thank you very much. Thank you.